In today's lesson, we'll look at reflection and refraction. The first aim is describe the difference between a real and virtual image, then explain the process of reflection, and finally explain the process of refraction. We can be very easily deceived by light. You may have heard stories about people wandering the desert, almost on the brink of collapsing from dehydration, when suddenly they see an oasis, that's a pool of water in the distance. So they run over to it, and what happens is the oasis disappears because what they've actually seen is a mirage, an illusion of water. Where does this illusion come from? Well, believe it or not, what people are actually witnessing is an image of the sky on the ground, so it looks like water. You see, in a desert, it's very hot near the ground. As a result, the air is less dense, the particles have more energy and they spread out. The further away you get from the ground, the more dense the air gets because it's cooler, so the particles are closer together. When light travels through mediums of different density, it can bend. So under normal conditions, you'd expect the light from the sky just to go directly into our eyes. But in a mirage, what happens is light, which is also going downwards, tends to bend as it travels through mediums of different density. As a result, an image of the sky is produced on the ground. We are actually seeing this image, but the light appears to be coming from here because of the bending light ray. This is therefore called a virtual image. It's not real. The light appears to be coming from somewhere where it isn't. So there are two types of images we can perceive, real images and virtual images. We get a real image when light from an object comes together, converges, to produce an image on a screen. So when you do lab experiments with lenses and you use a screen, what you're seeing on that screen is a real image. As a lens, basically takes the light coming from a source and brings it together to one point so you can see it on the screen. So the light from the top of the head forms an image at this point here and the light from the bottom of the feet forms an image here. Lenses cause real images to be inverted upside down. Similarly, our eye has a lens like this, a converging lens. So when images form on the back of the layer of our eye called the retina, it's also a real image because it focuses on a screen. Just be aware that the term screen can be loosely applied to various things. And of course, the most popular example of this is watching a film in the cinema. This is a real image produced on a screen. We get a virtual image when the light diverges. That means spreads out from an object, so it appears to be coming from a different place like our mirage. So one example of this is looking at your reflection in a mirror. It appears that your image is actually coming from beyond the screen, the same distance behind the screen as you are in front of it. But this is an illusion, it's not really there, the image isn't really behind the screen, so it is a virtual image. Similarly, when we look for a magnifying glass, the image appears more distant and bigger. This again is a virtual image because the light appears to be coming from some place it isn't. So this is this example here. This is a magnifying glass lens. This is the object we're actually focusing on, but the light is spread out, it's diverged by the lens. The result is the image we perceive is larger and further away, but it's not a real image. It's not really there. It's an illusion. It's a virtual image. So that is how we describe the difference between real and virtual images. Remember, real images are formed on a screen. So now let's look at reflection. You need to be a bit more sophisticated in your GCSEs. You can't just say reflection is when light bounces off an object, even if that's true. The more sophisticated definition is when waves hit a boundary of different density, some energy is reflected. That's the key idea. Energy is reflected. Smoother surfaces, like mirrors, will reflect more energy. So let's take an example here. Here I've got a mirror and this is air around it. Here, air represents the less dense medium because the particles are more spread out, and mirror represents the more dense medium because the particles are compacted close together because it's a solid, as opposed to a gas. So density is a measure of how much matter is crammed into a fixed volume of space. So air less dense, mirror more dense. I've drawn a dashed pink line here. This we call the normal. The normal is an imaginary line that's always drawn at 90 degrees at right angles to the reflecting surface or refracting surface as you'll see later. We draw normals just to work out angle relationships when it comes to reflection or refraction. So I've shown a light beam called the ray of incidence at the mirror. The normal will be drawn where the light ray contacts the surface, the reflecting surface. What the mirror will do is reflect some of that energy. 
So this beam, this light ray, represents the reflected ray, the ray of reflection. So we have the ray of incidence, the incoming ray, and the ray of reflection. Now this is where the normal is useful. You see, if I draw a line down the middle, the normal, then I can work out the angle on each side between the normal and the rays coming in and going out. Here I get two angles produced, the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. I'm sure it's not a shock to you that the angle of incidence in reflection always equals the angle of reflection. So angle I always equals angle R. So reflection has many uses to us. One quite cool use is getting pictures of fetuses in uh, pregnant women. This is called an ultrasound scan. Here an ultrasound emitter sends out high frequency sound waves. And when the sound waves encounter areas of different density, they will reflect. So remember, a baby is made from skin and bone and blood. All these things have different density, which will cause reflection at different points to produce a 3D image on a screen. So you can see the sound waves traveling forward, and now they're encountering the skin. So we're going from amniotic fluid to the skin, a change in density. So some of those waves get reflected, and the others continue. So now let's say we've hit bone. Once again, more energy will be reflected. The ultrasound scan machinery will convert these signals into digital images. But reflection is also uh, the cause of some of the most amazing magic illusions we can see. This is not one of them, but just to show you. It appears I'm hovering my finger over flame. When you go back, you can see it's a reflected image. This illusion is called the Pepper's Ghost illusion. You can see why here. You remove this away and suddenly the flame disappears. So why this works is firstly, you've got a reflective surface, but it's also transparent. So it's smooth, so some energy gets reflected back into your eyes. So this is a virtual image. So this is acting like a mirror as well as like a window. So I've actually got two tea lights here, but only this one's lit. So the advantage of this being transparent is I can see the other tea light. And the advantage of this being reflective is the image of the fire is being reflected so I can see it behind the screen. As I said, it's an illusion, a virtual image. Pretty simple thing I'm sure you could experiment with home to create better illusions. The best example I've seen of this is when the fashion designer Alexandra McQueen performed this illusion using Kate Moss, the supermodel. Using exactly the same principle, audiences were wowed by looking at an illusion, ghostly sort of apparition of Kate Moss dancing around with flowing fabrics. So it's a pretty old school illusion which people are still sort of reinventing to wow audiences with. I highly recommend you watch YouTube footage from this. It does look amazing. This picture does not do it justice. So that is how we explain the process of reflection. So now let's get to grips with refraction. Refraction is again another interesting visual uh, phenomena. You can see that I've put a pencil in water here, but you can see as it goes into the water, it suddenly looks like it's fractured. This is because as light travels through mediums of different density, it changes speed and it can bend. So the image appears to be somewhere it actually isn't. A really cool natural example of this is by a fish called the archerfish. The archerfish spits out jets of water to basically capture prey out of water, which are hovering above the water's surface. Now imagine, this is the real uh, flying creature it's trying to catch. But as light travels from it into the uh, archerfish's eyes, it bends as it gets into the water, because water is a different medium to air. But we perceive light in straight lines, so we see the image as if the light did not bend, and therefore the image is displaced over here. The actual flying creature seems like it's here. So if the archerfish shot water out here, it would hit nothing. Instead, it's managed to evolve a way to calculate exactly where the flying creature is, so it basically shoots a jet away from where it sees the image. That's really quite amazing. So refraction is when waves change speed as they travel through mediums of different density. Electromagnetic waves such as visible light, x-rays, UV and so on, slow down in more dense mediums. For example, if they're traveling from air to glass, they will slow down. But do note that sound waves will speed up. Remember, sound waves rely on particles knocking into each other. So in more dense mediums, like solids, the particles are closer to each other, and therefore when one knocks, it hasn't got far to travel before, it knocks into another particle, so it's much faster in solids. So this is my example to explain how refraction occurs with light waves, EM waves only, not sound waves. 
Imagine this an example, we have someone in a canoe, and the canoe is travelling from fresh water, nice clean fresh water, to thick, gloopy, swampy water, then back into fresh water. Now to propel themselves, they're using two oars. Once again, I've drawn a normal, this imaginary line at 90 degrees to this surface, the refracting surface this time, not reflecting surface. So hopefully this will make sense to you. As the canoe propels forward, it's fastest in fresh water, then when it hits the swampy water, both oars encounter the thick, sludgy, swampy water at the same time, so it slows down. And then when it reaches the fresh water, there's less sort of resistance from the thick, swampy water, so it speeds up again. So in less dense fresh water it's faster, in more dense thick water it's slower, then fresh water it's faster again. So that explains why it slows down, but it doesn't explain why light bends. Light will only bend when it's basically moving from one medium to another at an angle, not in the same direction as the normal, but at an angle to the normal. So let's see if you understand this. As the canoe basically moves forward, you can now see that this oar encounters the swampy water first, so it will slow down before this one. As a result, the canoe will turn, because one direction is moving faster than the other one. Then it'll move this way. Now at this point, hopefully you can see, this canoe is now in fresh water, and this one's still in thick, swampy, more dense water. As a result, this oar will be paddling faster than this one, so the canoe will turn and basically travel this way. The same principle can be applied from the other direction. So as the canoe moves here, now one of the oars is in swampy water, so it's slower than the other one, so it will basically bend this way. And then now one canoe is out of water, so it's faster, so it will bend this way. I mean, just imagine if you're walking, someone grabbed onto your left foot. Your right foot would be moving faster, and it would cause you to turn. But now let's look at a more scientific example, one which you might have done in a lab yourself. Here we've got air, which represents our fresh clean water, and glass, which is our thicker swampy water, and then air again. So what happens as light travels forward? You can see that one side of light will encounter the glass before the other side. As a result, the light will bend towards the normal in the more dense medium. When it's leaving the more dense medium, it will bend away from the normal. So look. Light's coming in here, you'd expect it to carry on straight here, but it doesn't. It bends towards this line, towards the normal. So from air to glass, the light bends towards the normal. Whereas at this point, you expect light to keep on going in a straight line, but it doesn't. It bends away from the normal. From glass to air, we bend away from the normal. Here's some common mistakes students make when doing refraction. Firstly, don't ever do this. Some people get to the normal and then reflect the light. That does not happen. This is not refraction. This is reflection, but it's not even reflection. It doesn't make sense, so don't do it. Sometimes people draw the light and bend it, but they bend it too much so it actually goes along with the normal. That's wrong as well. Don't do that. It doesn't bend so much that it actually matches the normal. It just bends towards the normal. So just remember this pattern. And it doesn't matter if you don't get it exact. You won't need a protractor to measure the angles exactly. You just go here towards the normal, then away. This angle here we call I, the basically angle of incidence as the incoming ray arrives, um, will be equal to R2, the second refracted ray between that and the normal. Whereas the first refracted angle, R1, will be equal to the second incoming ray. So remember, incoming here and then incoming to this point here. So this is why we have I and I2. Whereas this is the first refraction point, so this is R1 and this is R2 because it's the second time it bends. This is unlikely to come up, but just so you know, I1 is equal to R2, this angle is equal to this angle, and while I haven't drawn it to scale here, R1 is equal to I2. Even though this one looks small, it should be the same size. But if that's still too scary for you, just remember this, TAGAGA, this kind of babyish sounding uh, acronym. What this means is TAG is towards air to glass, so as light travels from air to glass, it bends towards the normal. And then aga is away glass air. What that means is as light moves from glass to air, it bends away from the normal. So towards normal is air to glass, and away from the normal is glass to air, to gaga. But it can get a little bit more sophisticated than that still. So here we're representing uh, light in a different way, diagrammatically speaking. This is a top-down view, and what we're seeing here is the crest of every wave. Now, just like before, as you can see, light will slow down as it enters the glass, it'll bend towards the normal, and then bend away as it speeds up as it leaves, providing it's coming in at an angle. 
so you already know that wave speed will decrease at this point. However, what you don't know is the wavelength also decreases, so the distance between the crest of one wave to the crest of the other. You can see the gap here is bigger, but in a more dense medium, it's shorter. Then once it leaves, again, the wavelength becomes bigger. Now, if you remember, frequency is the number of waves arriving at a point per second. Now, this may look like more waves, but because they're traveling slower, the overall frequency is the same. So frequency remains the same. Only wave speed and wavelength change as you move from one medium to another of different density. Finally, just one more exam style example. Imagine you have a mirror and the mirror has a glass block in front of it. Like most mirrors do, they're protected by glass. And you've got the reflective surface behind it. I'm showing you this because it's a good example of when reflection and refraction happen at the same time. So you can see this is the incoming ray, but this is glass, so some of the energy will be reflected because it's a medium of different density. But glass also allows light through it, so some will move and refract through. When it hits the mirror, it will be reflected again at the same angle as it came in. But when it leaves the glass, it will refract because it's a medium of different density. So the pink R's with the dashed lines, they represent when light is being reflected and the blue R's with solid yellow lines is when light is being refracted. So that is how we explain the process of refraction.